Five weeks ago, I talked to you about some specific benefits. I talked to you about an amazing program that would increase the average life expectancy of your children by eight years, significantly reduce your child's use and risk from alcohol, tobacco, and drugs, dramatically no lower their risk of suicide, help them rebound from depression 70% faster, dramatically reduce their risk for committing a crime, improve their attitude at school and increase their school participation, reduce their risk for rebelliousness, reduce the likelihood that they would binge drink in college, improve their odds of having a very happy life, and for yourselves, help you to have lower blood pressure, help you to live seven years longer, have fewer strokes, less clinical depression, and better immune system function. I told you about a wonderful thing that has all those benefits, and we found out that it was active church participation. We found out that it was not salvation, what we talked about in doing the Lord's Supper. Salvation ensures the certainty of your relationship with God. When you have put your trust in Jesus as the one who will save you, you are certain to go to heaven when you die. You are certain to always have a relationship with God. You are certain to have the Holy Spirit living in your heart trying to lead you in the right direction. Those things are fixed and cannot be changed. But while the certainty of your life with God is assured by putting your trust in Christ, the quality of your life with God is determined by the choices that we make day in and day out. The quality of our life with God, the depth of our life with God, the depth of relationship that we enjoy with Him, and the benefit that we see along the lines of these things that all of these studies from Duke and the National Institute of Health and these other places have shown, that depends on how much we invest in knowing God better. How much we invest in having God be a part of our life and get into our heart. Over the last four weeks, we've talked about the different ways that we actively participate. The concept of coming to the service and being a part of it. The idea of connecting with other people through small groups and through friendships within the church. The concept of serving, that, that we give of ourselves to our church, we give of ourselves to one another, we give of ourselves to the community around us, that we choose to serve, and that in so doing, we grow closer to God. Last week's week, we talked about the idea of growing to know God better. Whether that comes in a daily Bible reading or listening to Christian music. And we made a commitment together to every day this past week, do something. Watch a Christian music, a Christian music video, listen to a Christian song, read a passage of scripture. Something that focused our heart on Christ every day and draw us closer. But the thing is, up until now, it's all been about us. It's all been about our selfish desire for the things that active church participation gets us. But the truth is, don't we have people in our family that we wish had those same benefits? Don't we want our nieces and nephews to have eight extra years of life? Don't we want them to be protected from binge drinking or to at least some degree? Don't we want them to be less likely to get involved in, in drugs or in, in the misuse of alcohol? Don't we want for the children of our co-workers to have those kinds of benefits? Don't we have friends and neighbors that we wish to, to have a lower chance of heart attack and a greater ability to bounce back out of depression? You see, the reality is that, that Christianity, that the gospel, that a walk with God does all of these things for us, but we have people in our lives that don't have that relationship with God. Or people who've made that initial decision and have the certainty of a relationship with God, but have no quality of a relationship with God. That they made a decision at some point in their life and they've asked for his forgiveness and he's granted it, but they've never pursued intimacy with God. They've never pursued getting closer with God. They've been here and there, maybe going to church a little bit for a few weeks and then stopping for a few months. People in our lives that do not have that kind of connection to God, that kind of relationship with God, that we are deeply desiring. And that's why the fifth part of active church participation is this idea of going. That Christ built in from the very beginning, from the deepest part, from the first place in what he did with the disciples, this concept that we must go beyond these walls, out these doors, outside of our houses, to reach people who do not yet know Christ. 
to reach people who perhaps know Christ, but have no quality of relationship with him, no growth and no depth in their spiritual life. And God calls us to do this. Jesus lays it upon us as an individual mandate when he hands us the Great Commission. And he tells us that we are supposed to be going and making disciples everywhere, all over the world. He calls us to that. He tells us that is our job and what is necessary in the world for people to come to him. And instead of choosing to write it in the sky in the clouds, instead of sending angels to everybody to show up, instead of sending dreams to every person on the planet about how they need to follow Jesus, he entrusts us with the mission of taking the word to them. But that's terrifying, isn't it? It's absolutely terrifying. I'm supposed to go and tell my coworker, my friend, my buddy, my person who lives down the road that they need to come to church, that they need to know God, that they need to come to Jesus. And in the culture that we live in, people look at us like we grew an extra head. When we say, oh, anything other than you're okay, I'm okay, you do your spiritual thing, I'll do my spiritual thing, and everybody will be fine. But when instead you say, well, no, what you really need is to get closer to Jesus and this sort of online thing you've been doing for your religion, it just doesn't really cut it. Then when we talk to people about the reality of what the Bible has to say about how we're supposed to live our life and how we're trying to follow that, that, that it strikes a chord where people want to push back and fight back and say, no, we don't have to obey anything. We just do whatever we think is best and that's going to be good enough. And yet... In the midst of that kind of challenge, that kind of difficulty, it can be so hard to get through and to actually be able to share the gospel with someone. It can be so hard to get through and actually be able to feel like you're getting anywhere talking to someone about God. The great part is, Jesus understands our frustrations. Jesus understands our frustration and he shows us what we can do in order to bring people in that we don't think that we could. We're in John chapter 4. And in John chapter 4, what goes on here is that Jesus and his disciples are in Samaria. They stop at a well. Jesus stays there, and the guys go into town to get food. And while he's there, a woman comes up, and Jesus strikes up a conversation with her. Now, at this point, all of you who've been in church for a while think that I'm going to tell you all about what Jesus told this person, tell you the five points you need to share to share the gospel with them, and then you'll be able to be sure of that. Well, guess what? I'm not going to do that. Because you're not Jesus, and I'm not Jesus. And we don't get special supernatural knowledge about what the other person's sins are, and then have the right way to tell them about them. Um, I don't know about you, but every time I try to tell someone about what's wrong in their life and get specific... Things have not ended well. <laughs> because I think that when it comes to what Christ experienced here, we are not Jesus in this historical outcome. We are not Jesus who is standing there and telling this woman at the well how she can be saved. We're the woman at the well. We're the person who needed to be saved. We're the person who needed to hear the gospel. And so what I'm going to do is I'm going to jet over that first part where Jesus explains to her that, that he really is the Messiah and she needs to follow him and she needs to put her trust in him. At the end of their conversation, the disciples show back up. And starting in verse 27, at this point his disciples came and they were amazed that he'd been speaking with a woman. Yet no one asked, what do you seek or why do you speak with her? Because once again, the disciples were looking at Jesus and going... I don't even know where to start. What are we doing? 28. So the woman left her water pot and went into the city and said to the men, Come, see a man who told me all the things that I have done. This is not the Christ, is it? And they went out of the city and they were coming to him. She had met Jesus. Everybody in the town knew who she was. Everybody in the town knew her sin. Everybody in the town knew why she was at the well at the wrong time of the day so she could avoid dealing with everybody's nasty stares. And she runs in and says so she talked to the men. What it's talking about there is there was this custom 
of the older men in the community to sit at the gate of the city and basically, um, well, best modern day equivalent, parties in the morning. <laughs> Except in that situation, these guys actually had power. They were the village elders. What they discussed became the way things were. And she runs up to this group of people who were probably the most condemning, who were probably the most angry, who probably had treated her the worst of everyone, and she blurts out, I met this guy. At which point they all go, aww. He told me everything I'd ever done. Is he the Christ? I don't know. And what she shared about what he'd done in her life was so compelling that they ran out to go see him. They ran out to go check this out. Now, most of us, you know, we, we all went to, those of us who went to youth camps or, or um, special youth events like that, you know what always happened when it came to time for the testimony. That when somebody was going to give a testimony, or the speaker was going to give a testimony about their life, they'd always get up in front of everyone and go, well, I started being abused when I was five years old. And then I turned to drugs. And then I did this and this, and I had a police record, and then I found Jesus. And because we've heard that over and over again as the testimony, we think that my testimony, I grew up, I went to church, but I didn't really get it, and I was really, really self-righteous and thought I was just the best guy in the world until I found out that I wasn't, and I was actually kind of a jerk and not following God's word. And it broke my heart, and then I turned to Christ, and Jesus convicted me of what I'd been, and I changed from who I was to being less self-righteous and far less impressed with myself and more impressed with everyone else. That that's just somehow not exciting enough. That I gotta spice it up. I gotta throw in a, a trip to Cancun where I got held hostage by terrorists or something <laughs> in order to make a great testimony. But what does this woman really say? She shows up, she says, He told me everything I've ever done. Do you think he could be the Christ? Just as most of us have not been that far down before Christ rescued us. Most of the people we meet haven't been either. Most of the people we meet haven't you know, been abused from a young age. Most of the people we meet didn't go completely off the radar. Most of the people we meet did not go down you know, and become fighters with the Contras down in Nicaragua. Most of the people we meet led fairly ordinary lives, just like us. And most of the people we meet have fairly ordinary problems. Like, how do I deal with my child in a way that preserves the relationship, but I can still give them instruction and tell them what to do? They have ordinary problems like, how do I relate to my mom? I'm so mad about the choices she's made recently, but how do I preserve that relationship without condoning the choices she's been making? Most people out there have the same kind of problems we have. And what they're looking for is not some magical, incredible answer to how they can take their completely destroyed life and turn it around and finally fix their, their major deep problems. Most people are looking for, how do I live in a way where I feel like I'm really doing the right thing? How do I get through today and tomorrow while my family member is in the hospital sick and we don't know what's going to happen? And what they want to know from us is the way that God helped us get through our mom's about the cancer. What they want to know is how God worked in our relationship with our children to preserve it in ways that we, we didn't understand, but we were smart enough to shut our mouth when he told us to shut it and open it when he told us to open it. What they want to know is how did you get along with that neighbor who's been driving you nuts? Because I got a neighbor who's driving me nuts. That's what they want to know. They want to know how Jesus works in our ordinary lives so they can get through their ordinary lives. Because that's really who we are. We're the woman at the well. We met Jesus. And in reading his word and getting closer to him and getting closer to God's people and, and learning things in, in Sunday school and, and in the service, God's changed your heart about some stuff. 
And in those times when we've been holding on by our fingernails, God has grabbed our hands and lifted us up. <clears throat> we've got something to say. And instead of feeling like we've got to be dramatic, or we've got to have all the answers, Jesus says, just invite them to come see me. Because when they do come and they see Jesus, this is what happens. From that city, many of the Samaritans believed in him because of the word of the woman who testified. He told me all the things I've ever done. So when the Samaritans came to Jesus, they were asking him to stay with them. And he stayed two days. Many more believed because of his word. And they were saying to the woman, it is no longer because of what you said that we believe. For we have heard for ourselves. And we know that this one is indeed the Savior of the world. That's what we want to do next Sunday. To hold Jesus up. To say this is who he is. This is how he matters in your day to day life. So that people can get introduced to Him. So that even though they come because we invite them. Even though they come because we tell them about how God has changed our life. Even though they have an interest in Christ because we tell them. That when they come and they get to know Him. That eventually they say to us. I believe not because of what you said. Not because it was super persuasive. Not because it was just what I needed. Not because of any of those things. I believe. Because now I've met Jesus. Now I see what he's really like. And because of him, I want to follow him. Instead of because of you. Towards that end, I've got one thing we're asking you to do this week. And that's we're asking you to take 10 of these invitation cards. Now, the running joke is you take one to the inside of the stall at work. Not a bad idea. You leave it with a tip. A good tip. Okay? We, we got a bad reputation. Let's not keep going with our bad reputation. It's been a long time since I was a waiter, but I still remember what it was like. You see, four families in ties are just like, oh, I'm getting a buck and a half. Um, which was not real money when I was a waiter, thank you very much. Just in case some of you think I'm older than I am. One of the best things to do, when you get home, go down your street to your neighbors. Hi, I want to invite you out to our church. That was tough. Um, so far, in giving away invitation cards, I have had one guy who was a cashier at a food lion hand me back the card. That's the most negative reaction I've got. And even he didn't realize that he'd been rude and went, oh, oh, sorry. I'm like, no, it's fine. I just didn't expect that. <laughs> so on your way out, one of the ushers will have him hand him out. If you can pick up 10 and invite people. Invite people you know. Invite people you meet. Invite people you don't know yet. Whatever it takes. Because people really want to know Jesus. And people definitely need Jesus. Even if they don't know him yet. At this point, we're going to uh, receive the offering. 